And if not, the mycelial network will make sure that like you, things like humidity or water resources, uh, different types of uh, nutrition are being kind of distributed equally through different trees um, in the same patch. And that's kind of like something that the mycelial network is able to provide. All the participants are like a little piece and together with the virtual environment, we kind of are artificial intelligence. <laughs> We're interested in the idea of game because you give up a little bit of your authorship to the audience and you're saying, okay, here is the game and you are free to compose this exhibition or expand this exhibition visually in your own terms. So we are in the middle of the exhibition Tracing a Seeping Terrain by the artists who are right next to me, Anne de Boer and Eloise Bonvio, who I've invited here to the Heidelberger Kunstverein to do a show over the first floor and the second floor of the Kunstverein. And what they have done here is they have created a, an interactive role play with sculptures they produced anew, all connected to each other, that can be activated by visitors and participants. And I think this is a, a very interesting approach with the topics they are involved with, which is ecology and technology. And they have worked before a lot with gaming, both like board games, but also um, video games, which is something the world of gaming or video games is something contemporary artists for the past maybe 10 years or so, they've really tapped into this as a new medium to create worlds. And also they have used the aesthetic of gamings in the world to generate new worlds or to just use um, technology as a creative way to um, build landscapes or use it as a means of participation. And um, here in the exhibition, there's an additional layer because the interface of how to engage with these worlds are actually in themselves sculptures and uh, different um, artworks in themselves. So I think before we go into the first question, you can introduce yourself and maybe we can hear a little bit um, how you've come to work together as a duo. Thanks for the introduction. Yeah, so we have been uh, working together since 2011. Uh, first, we worked together in a collective called Hardcore. Uh, and there we were more, um, it was with two um, other people, Simon de Thor Helgeson and Harapne de Helgedotter. And we were very much interested in collective exhibition making and finding open structures of curating shows. And kind of at the end of this uh, collaboration, we developed um, uh, a curator robot that would be able to curate shows according to environmental inputs such as gas, amount of light, uh, things like that. Um, but meanwhile, we were working on this uh, uh, curatorial robot. We started working really as a duo since 2014 um, as the mycological twist. And um, uh, um, with this uh, collaboration, we were very much interested in mycelium, mushrooms, kind of everything that's growing under uh, our floor, the dirtiness of uh, something that you consider ecology, and how we can kind of dive into this um, uh, part of, of uh, ecology that is like kind of disregarded or not really part of the, the discourse um, when we think about saving our environment in some way. Um, I think that's like very briefly maybe an intro. Like in this collective, in this collaboration, we really uh, first looked at mushrooms and kind of used uh, mycelium structures as an inspiration. But then since this year, we uh, decided to continue just under our own names and be able to open it up outside mushrooms and yeah, uh, bring together our own interest into this uh, collaboration again. Yeah, I think um, as we were collaborating, um, it became clear that we are interested in broader topics um, then mycelium, then mycelium for, 
for us was more like an excuse to talk about uh, also social connection and of course the obvious parallel between the mycelium that is called the nature internet and uh, digital culture. And we were interested in like, in this digital culture and how they function and and how also they function with ecology. So for us, it became uh, more and more about uh, this digital culture and ecology and gaming. And so we really drifted away from the subject of uh, the mycelium uh, per se, but we're still very much something that is staying is that we're still very much interested in uh, in the materials and we have this reflection on the mat what kind of materials we're using and how they kind of like they have also this dark side you know how everything that you produce as there is a notion of waste and and this is something we're um, looking at and another point that I wanted to make which I think is why um, it's interesting when we think about our other collective where we had this curator robot that at the end made an exhibition for non, with non-human uh, aesthetic criteria, which I think is kind of a thematic that is running in our collaboration. We always try to sort of make works that invite the audience to go beyond what their normal per perception, uh, aesthetic perception or choices would be, but try to have like, uh, yeah, step into uh, other being uh, shoes, basically. Yeah, it's interesting. You mentioned now um, two key points for your practice. One is they are not only working as artists producing works, but they also curate shows. So often um, in the past, they have been invited uh, by curators to actually invite other artists. And so you have taken on this role of the curator, but also your um, practice is um, incorporates performative elements. So for example, game sessions, people, you create a space where people come together um, to do something um, in a cooperation kind of. And the other thing that I just wanted to repeat is that you, Anna, you mentioned um, that how you started to work together was um, you built something that incorporated artificial intelligence. And then you, you said further on, you're interested in um, mushrooms. And this was basically the point where your interest joined together. So on the one hand, you have um, artificial intelligence and technology, and then a biological system that is often um, compared to how artificial intelligence or computation works. So maybe you can um, explain this a little bit further, maybe what the research is, or maybe some of you in the audience have heard that about mushrooms or even trees, how they communicate um, through their roots in the forest. And this is very hard maybe to imagine, um, but this is not so far from how we could imagine in the internet maybe. Yeah, I think I'll, I'll start just with the idea of artificial intelligence and I think maybe also, because it's again, it, it feels like it's always a bit on the feedback loop, this topic, like it comes to the surface and then it kind of quiets down and now it's back again a lot with ChatGPT or different forms of artificial intelligence that are coming to the surface or like uh, artificially generated images. And what is, has been fascinating us in this discussion always has been that lots of the fascination of artificial intelligence is very much about trying to reproduce some form of human intelligence. And for us, the interest in artificial intelligence is actually trying to come up with in forms of intelligences that produces something other than human. So it's not about kind of having this echo machine that can do something that we already manage, uh, but actually try to think of uh, how could we create or engage with systems that would come up with uh, other end results in the end that uh, might be far more interesting than just being able to reproduce a Van Gogh painting or something like. I think also if you think of uh, in terms of uh, 
uh, artificial intelligence and you think about all the, co the content that is being produced uh, in terms of uh, writing, but also in terms of images, we would, I think maybe if you think of like uh, an aesthetic of the AI, really what would be pleasing like for the artificial intelligence. The, now they are just executing commands. So in a way it's, yeah, what you said, that they are generating an aesthetic that is pleasing for us because they're executing a command. I think it would be much more interesting to look at, maybe their aesthetic is just like electrical signal in the system in a certain pattern. And, and we cannot even comprehend this as a visual or as a sensorial experience. So we are much more interested in like, this non-obvious way of communicating that are to us very uh, in um, impossible to comprehend and uh, yeah, mysterious. Yeah, and I think that relates back to the, let's say the internet of the forest or like the kind of mycelial networks as, as forms of intelligence. Um, it's a kind, like you have the mycelial like networks uh, that are connected to the roots of trees for example, and they are able to communicate between uh, trees whether uh, distribution of nutrition is happening in a kind of uh, equal way. And if not, the mycelial network will make sure that uh, like you, things like humidity or water resources, uh, different types of uh, nutrition are being kind of distributed equally through different trees um, in the same patch. And that's kind of like something that the mycelial network is able to provide. And I think kind of like diving into this idea of, of these structures, you can kind of like analyze what's happening, sort of the effects of it, like trees grow better or they have more nutrition and stuff like that. But for us, it's kind of interesting to think like, how, what would, how would this sound like? Or how would this, uh, um, like kind of imagining them having a cup of coffee together and like what would be the conversation, you know? Like, and, and trying to um, dive into it with a little bit uh, glasses of, of humor to see these possible tragedies and like gossip that happen in, in places that we don't have really uh, access to. And um, I think that's a bit what within our work that we always try to playfully engage with is like, yeah, we can, we can apply our own sort of, sort of like sense of humor onto these uh, things that we have no idea what they're actually talking about. So. And I also I think just an extra point when we talk about network or internet network, um, I think it's something I mean, there is danger in metaphors, of course, but I think there is something interesting in looking at internet and also in terms of social place that can be quite toxic. And looking back again at this internet of things and the way nature works, that also is not this pastoral sort of utopic vision where everything is like uh, equally distributed. For instance, like you have this tree, the um, uh, walnut tree, is gonna use the mycelium network to actually steal nutrient from other trees. Um, so in a way, this when you put these two things next to each other, they start to be in conversation in a very interesting way. Um, and I think that exactly that uh, that's um, tension that we're uh, exploring and interested in. And um, is there artificial intelligence anywhere in this exhibition? Oh, always. <laughs> no, but I think there is, um, um, in a way, we try to think of uh, the virtual environment in a way um, that I, it's not necessarily like uh, generative or like, or like kind of like, um, like it's not has, a, has not some kind of ma machine learning system behind it. But we think always like uh, forms of intelligence don't need to be very complicated either. And there is a kind of decision making and trying to kind of uh, patch together inputs uh, that it receives from the audience and um, uh, kind of create new scenarios out of this. So I feel like always, yeah, talking about artificial intelligence, I think very simple forms of making yes, no decisions are forms of, intelli uh, of intelligence, but it's just very basic in some ways. And yeah, I'm, I'm going to continue a little bit on that. I think if you, if you think it of the uh, mechanical uh, talk, is that the term for it? It's like basically when you think there is something that is being automated on the internet, but it's not. Uh, Amazon is using that a lot. And also when you're being asked to select the images, you know, you are, you are like, select all the traffic light. Um, so in a way, you're like a machine 
And I think maybe this exhibition is more like this, like all the participants are like a little piece and together with the virtual environment, we kind of are uh, artificial intelligence in a way. <laughs> yeah, I mean, in this way we just talked about it, it became clear that we maybe, we say artificial intelligence and we think people or everyone understands what it actually is, but many things can be artificial intelligence and yeah, we also don't know yet what it will become. Maybe now we can tap into the different parts of these exhibitions and how, with which people you uh, collaborated to produce the show, as I have mentioned um, before, you work with other people, but you have also um, done entire um, video games, for example, you have programmed them yourself, um, but for this show you have worked with um, yeah, other people, maybe you can say, tell us a bit, little bit about this. Yeah, yeah. so, I mean, indeed, um, in, in a lot of the past projects, we've always been kind of uh, very much interested with, like, how much can we do ourselves? And, like, a lot of, like, YouTube tutorials and uh, <laughs> DIY manuals to kind of get to a certain end result. Um, and for, uh, for this uh, case, we have been working with a programmer to uh, develop the virtual environment because we wanted to actually push it a bit further than what we can do ourselves as well and uh, be in conversation with someone that has the technical knowledge to actually uh, create something in an optimal way. So this uh, we worked with Nicolas Delep in, on the virtual environment who is an artist based in Manchester and um, yeah, it has been kind of really amazing because you just give the input sort of like more or less this is what we want and someone else is bringing in their ideas of what you have told them and it, this constant uh, feedback with each other has been very uh, interesting. I think it's also for us, it's, um, I mean, we love collaborating with people. That's something we do a lot, but it was interesting to, and also we try to credit it in a way where they are very visible, all these people, and for us it's, interest, it's important that, um, that the audience understand that this kind of show, they cannot be produced with two people, or you know, that um, there is this idea sometimes that the artist is a super, super human, or like you also have this uh, figure of the curator as a super, super curator that goes everywhere, but very often behind there is uh, this uh, small, small hands that actually are doing so much. Um, so uh, for us, it was interesting to include um, other people in the creative process, so not invite them to do their own work, but really like invite them to create with us these pieces, because again, you acknowledge the social aspect of, uh, of the creative process, and, uh, and again, like you open this idea of authorship, and I think that's also something we are trying to do when we invite the audience in and why we're, um, we're interested in the idea of game because you give up a little bit of your authorship to the audience and you're saying, okay, here is the game and you are free to um, compose this exhibition or experience this exhibition visually in your own terms. That can be a bit scary, but I think that's a, a little bit, uh, like we enjoy that aspect. Yeah, and for the sound piece in this, um, in the environment here, we worked with Bastian Hagedorn, who is a, a musician, an experimental uh, percussionist, and we wanted him. So each time you tap in one of the playing cards, you hear one of the sound effects that is being played throughout the whole space. And we worked with him to really kind of, uh, yeah, there's 42 different cards. So there's 42 different sounds that last a minute, and he, yeah, really kind of like brought together different layers of sound that kind of really are composed in this space that it kind of really feels in a way that these effects, they're hard to place to one particular location, which has been quite enjoyable yesterday in the opening as well, because people tapped in the cards and sometimes like listen to the sculptures themselves that don't have speakers, but it's because the sound also sometimes is so kind of unclear where it comes from that it's really hard to lo locate exactly where you should find the source. And that I think is really a credit to Bastian in some way. And uh, 
he has done the team song as well that is now on mute but uh, uh, it was also about like kind of finding a sound piece that um, we we we, have, we play, play a lot of video games ourselves. Bastian plays also quite some games himself, and we really love this um, ability in games to compose your own kind of sound environment. It can be there's always kind of a, a team song playing on the background. Depending on the game, it gets more and more intense when you are having more action in the landscape, and then when you meet other characters, they make their, make their own sound and. Uh, so kind of, uh, you're always a little bit the author of your ambient uh, environment in some way. And uh, at that time I was playing Diablo, which is a game that is like, um, essentially end up with like having to kind of slaughter lots of like weird animals around you. And it's kind of like gruesome in some ways. But the uh, soundscape is like fantastic. It's just like, kind of like crazy, uh, like horrific sounds almost nonstop. But if it gets too much, you just walk away and it becomes really peaceful, like some birds are whistling or like wind is blowing. And um, I think we kind of like were looking a bit for how can you, yeah, how can we create a sound piece that allows the audience to kind of make it all super intense or really kind of go for a slow pace, quiet experience and tap one card and then wait for two minutes and then tap the other one. But uh, yeah, yesterday with so many uh, people in the audience, there were some that were tapping like every, every second after each other. So it was, was getting kind of crazy, which was beautiful as well. Yeah, I, I think it's um, interesting how you moved away from this format of you sit in your desk and you have your controller and the um, thing in front of you and then you're in this world where, where you really feel immersed into it as well. But then the challenge that you wanted to um, overcome here was how can we do this in a white cube exhibition space where you enter a room, you are affected by the changes um, of the soundscape, but also of the what you see. And then what is also like a funny twist is that you use uh, playing cards from board games to actually um, provoke these changes um, and what I wanted to ask you since you were speaking of the virtual environment as this is maybe not uh, so clear for um, our audience um, it's not a video it's a game and you use that to build your own world but how is this done? What do um, people that create works digitally, what do they use, basically? Yeah, so, um, so like to build a virtual environment or a video game, you usually work with a game engine, which is a kind of a software that is being produced by a game developer that they use. It's kind of... Um, how, how would you explain this? A, a, a program that contains all the information to simulate any uh, landscape or universe in some way. Uh, so essentially, it gives, uh, it has calculated inside that program what is gravity, what is wind, what is sunlight. And from there, you can uh, start literally sculpting anything that you like. It's also used a lot actually within. Uh, um, the world of architecture to kind of create uh, a version of a house to show to the audience like this is how the building is going to look like because you can create um, the environment as it would appear uh, anywhere in a landscape basically. But it has all the kind of like physics that you normally would encounter in the world as well but you can tweak it to make it uh, as if we're on Mars or as we, like it can become quite uh, uh, different than what we are used to. So then you have kind of that software and in there you can uh, uh, then compose whatever you want to make. There's a lot of like content that is created by others that you can drag inside like buildings, trees, which is also a little bit what happens in our environment is that like lots of the, you can like have a plant package with like a thousand different plants and then you can pick which plants you want to have in your environment. So. That's kind of like there's a like a large network of people kind of contributing then to this software uh, with their own visuals and um, 
And also, um, it's kind of a, an interesting uh, topic, this idea of the library of that is open source and people can don just download the plan for a town or uh, this type of character or this type of plant. And that feeds a little bit again in the AI um, discussion because in machine learning, one of the main issue is that what is the content that is being fed to the machine? And most of this content is really biased. Um, so you get a very distorted uh, uh, representation of reality. And in video game, it's a little bit the same problem. Who is pre producing these libraries? And what kind of person is represented in, in this library? How is nature represented in this library? So I think it's interesting to work with this virtual environment because in a way, you're also confronted with the limit of the system itself. So I'm really happy visually how it looks like, but I would love to sort of do more work on creating uh, more libraries and and there is I mean, a whole field of research on how we could push this to become more weird, less obvious, uh, uh, less um, uh, bordered and uh, more entangled in the way reality actually works where uh, borders are less clear than in video games. But like a nice Easter egg in this landscape is actually that Nicholas uh, went around uh, on lots of his hikes and he made 3D scans of uh, ruins and stones that he found on his hike. So we're not passing by one at the moment, but like sometimes there's a little ruin or like a man here standing in a landscape and, and those are uh, scanned by Nicholas himself. So there's a, it's quite a nice little, uh, yeah, yeah. Maybe before we um, open up for questions from the audience, I had one more um, thing that I find uh, we have to we haven't touched upon yet, which is uh, you have some works here in the exhibition that are maps. So the exhibition itself, I think, also kind of works a little bit like a map with different stations and you're guided through it in a particular way. Um, but maybe you can tell us about the prints upstairs and as well as the handmade um, papers that are down here. Yeah, so for us, um in in our work, uh, we always like to have a kind of, like present a work that is able to speculate or to dream or think or fantasize uh, about the future that we want to go to. So kind of always try to be able to, in a time which is quite hard to sort of like think of a future that is livable in some way, to find pathways where we can say, this is what I would like to see in the future. And we do quite some uh, workshops as well, uh, where we always try to engage with students like, okay, but what is the future you would like to see and activate people in that way. And for us, the maps are kind of a personal way also of like uh, creating uh, in one way the downstairs one really fantasy maps and, and play a bit with the idea of the, the fantasy maps um, that you normally find when you open a a science fiction or a fantasy book, there's always a little map drawn in the on the first page that kind of explains what the landscape is you're going to engage with. Um, and as a format, we find this always quite engaging because you immediately place yourself there. Like these maps, they're really effective in like, yes, I am next to that mountain and I understand totally that this town is here on the left and that must have been so long if you walk from there to there. and. I think they really activate uh, the sort of like physical aspect of the story in some way. Um, so this is like the, the, the downstairs one, they really engage with it from a f sort of fantasy angle. Um, uh, and they're also a little bit uh, more open. They're not necessarily a map, but we made this paper ourselves from mushroom and we really enjoy the surface of the, p uh, the paper that becomes kind of a landscape in itself. So they're kind of, play with the ink on the paper becomes a relief and you start to kind of, it becomes maybe mountains or a little stream. So it's kind of a detail in a detail in some way. Um, uh, so in a way also like where downstairs we have a, a fictional landscape, we wanted to route the exhibition somehow back into reality as well. And the maps that you have upstairs, they're all of uh, different environmental disasters that, that happened in the past years. So there's something called uh, Copernicus, which is the Institute uh, 
I forgot the exact full name of it, but it's the, uh, an institute of the European Union uh, that maps disasters in one hand, and it maps also, uh, does a kind of risk analysis of location. So it kind of gives a suggestion it would be able to flood here, and then we, you could kind of like think of solutions in this and this location to prevent the next flooding. Um, and all the maps upstairs, they are from like satellite images um, and data recorded by this Copernicus Institute of, of recent disasters. So there's like one of a flooding here in West Germany, uh, I think two years ago. Uh, there's one of the wildfires now in uh, uh, Rhodes. That's the one in the far end. And in a way, uh, we wanted to root back this exhibition back into kind of this, this climate uh, catastrophe that's happening around us. But on these maps, there are uh, symbols uh, printed on them that you find back onto your playing cards. Uh, and these uh, icons, they all have a bit more like an optimistic element, sort of a wish for the landscape, how to continue after this disaster in some way. And uh, it kind of also kind of, a, to, in a way, to conclude the gameplay, uh, you have to st still kind of like find that last uh, bit of information in your playing cards. It's also a little bit kind of like rooting it back into the reality that we're in today in some way. Yeah, and they also show um, or are a good example of your interest in how we simulate reality and also how we want to communicate climate change. And we can question if this is an effective way because these maps are open source, so anyone could have a look. And it's the graphs or maps or all these representations are always very dry and kind of abstract of horrific situations. And this is a very different way of engaging with this catastrophe than just watching the media of houses that are being flooded or people um, being there and all of this. So I think it's a, um, yeah, another aspect that you are engaging with how we communicate climate change and how we represent um, changes to the environment. Yeah, I think as a, a addition to that, indeed, is a good point because the, all the icons on the playing cards for us, this is a development also of like how do we create um, or how can you propose a kind of visual language that can leave a mark on the landscape where some disaster happened? It can bring back an emotion to a landscape that when you just have the plain map will never be there. Um, the landscape changes. Uh, the geographical features uh, will change in some way, the uh, way it's being inhabited will change, but that the, uh, that emotional layer of having to move to another place that will never be uh, displayed on the map. Um, it will be just, a, uh, maybe it says like it's a ruin or an abandoned building, but that emotional aspect of being dislocated will never find its way into the map. And this is for us a kind of way of activating that process, like how can we find languages to embed emotion back into this very abstract language? And I guess this is like, I mean, you mentioned that the exhibition is like a map, and I think that's uh, actually a very good point. And I think that this whole, this whole exhibition uh, is kind of a tryout uh, of that, uh, creating new language, new visual language, but also new sound languages to approach uh, th this trauma and these changes we're going through. Um, and that's why we called it tracing a uh, seeping terrain because it's always in motion and we are like, I think all of us in some way desperately trying to understand or make it steady, but then it always escapes somehow our, our um, efforts to, to control it. Mm.